welcome. Oh, I should say welcome back to my my. Um, this is neighborhood board 14. For those of you who don't remember, we were meeting here back four years ago, three and a half. So it's, it's nice to be back home and seeing all the smiling faces in person rather than on a WebEx. So again, thank you for joining us. There's a couple of administrative announcements. First of all, if you have a cell phone, please turn off your cell phones. And also, um, if you need to be recognized, please raise your hand. And if you're gonna speak, we like to come up to the microphone over here, you can adjust the height. That's for tall Holly guys. You short oriental, you just put it down a little bit, okay? So uh, please come up so that we can see your smiling face. And we are on Olelo, and that's our, our cameraman over there. Jordan, thank you. Nice seeing you. Three and a half years, huh? The length of your beard is still the same, but oh, okay. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's get started. First order of business. Uh, oh, by the way, it is now uh, six. Let's, we started the meeting at 6.35. Uh, first order of business, we have to elect a treasurer. Although, how much money do we have? I don't think very much. I'll open the, the floor for nominations for the treasurer. Brendan? I nominate Dale White for treasurer. Dale yeah, White, any other nominations? If not, since Dale is the only person being nominated, I'll entertain a motion that... Uh, as our, as I move. Second. And second that Dale White be our treasurer for neighborhood board. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motions carry. Congratulations. All right. But by the way, Spencer, how much money do we have? Spencer, yeah, what? <laughs> Can we find out how much we have? Can we? I mean, I mean, we got the treasure with you know, no money. Oh, you know, you know. Okay, all right, moving right along. Um, wow. Uh, do we have a representative from the Honolulu Fire Department? Yes. Oh. Hi. Uh, yes, right here. Oh. Um. Yeah, we still got a way of X over here. Maybe can we turn off this this bank of lights right over here so everybody can see? How do we do that? Is it, yeah, can you give it? Yeah, bear with us. This is it's been three and a half years. Oh. We're getting used. To, oh, right. Okay, don't fall us. Right, yeah, that no, that was good. That was good. That was. That that's okay. Right now. Is that okay, Jordan? Yeah, he said it's okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm a little fire department. You're on. Hi. Right, um, my name's uh firefighter Chad Yamada. Um, so for the month of August 2023, these are our incident stats. So first for structure fires, we've had zero structure fires in August, zero wildland fires, two nuisance fires, one cooking fire, four activated alarms, 108 medical calls, zero uh, motor vehicle collisions, zero motor vehicle crashes, zero mountain rescues, zero ocean rescues, and zero hazardous material incidents. Hey, okay, and our uh, safety tip. For this month is evacuation planning. So in the, in the event of an emergency, be prepared with an evacuation plan. Create your plan with all members of your family slash household. Keep in mind those with limited abilities, such as, such as children, elderly, and pets. Identify possible exits and escape routes. Predetermine a safe meeting place. Always choose an escape route that is safest, and think about various scenarios and strategize how to use them. Review and practice the plan often. Assemble an emergency supply kit. Remember to pack important documents, medicines, and necessary pet items. Remember to stay calm, stay informed, and stay alert. 
And for more for, for more information, visit fire.honolulu.gov. And the report. Thank you. I got a big question. Now that we experience the tragedy on Lahaina, is our fire department more so I'm concerned about since I live up on top of Aleva Heights and some of the neighbors are here. You know, we're right next to the Kamehameha School Forest Reserve and the trees are very tall and it gets dry up there. Are we ready for, well, do we have contingency plans if it should catch on fire? Yes, so, so since this incident has happened, the whole of the fire department has changed its response plans, such as uh, sending more emergency vehicles. We've also tried to identify areas that could potentially um, be hazardous for wildfires or for you know, dry conditions. I think um, also that incident in Lahaina, it was a storm of like kind of like a, it was dry heat, high winds, um, down cell towers. So the whole of the fire department is doing what we can to try and plan as best as we can for that. Are you going to announce it to not only our neighborhood board, but other neighborhood boards where they may be affected by, uh, you know, brush fire? This is a pilot program right now. So, so uh, right now it's still a pilot program, so we're still working on it. Um, okay, so let us think... know. I'm a little worried because we have quite a few houses next to that forest reserve. Any other questions from the board? Any questions from the public audience? If not, thank you very much, H HFD. Uh, next, Honolulu Police Department. Hi, good evening, everyone. This is Lieutenant Creighton Atiko at the Kali Police Station. I'm uh, one of the nighttime commanders for the for the district. And uh, let me give you some stats for um, the month of August. For burglaries, um, which could include um, residential and also business, uh, we had nine, which is uh, an uptick from five in July. Uh, for motor vehicle thefts, we had seven, um, which is consistent with six in July. Uh, for thefts general, we had 17 thefts um, in your guys' area, uh, which is a slight, uh, slightly up from 15 in July. And for UAMVs, uh, break-ins into vehicles, we had eight in August as compared to five in July. Uh, one safety tip I have for you folks, um, lately we've been having a lot of traffic accidents in our stretch of the freeway and, and our thoroughfares. Um, and a lot of it, I can, uh, in, in my opinion, it's, it's from inattention. And sometimes the inattention is due to us driving while we're tired, and it's it's understandable. But um, it's really you need to listen to your bodies. Uh, if you guys are feeling um, too tired to drive, um, it might be better to take a break in the car on the side of the road somewhere safely parked, as opposed to driving. Um, but other than that, um, we also still have a epidemic of people driving while on. Um, either phones or tablets, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, we were always on the lookout for that, for that sort of thing. And so just to um, make sure that the constituents are aware that we still, we still, that's something that it's very important to the police department. Are there any questions? Any questions? For the board? Yes. Officer, thank you so Question. much for um, your report really appreciate it. Uh, just wanted to thank the Honolulu Police Department. I know that a lot of my friends and neighbors call in to you all, and you're very responsive and you really help out the community. So we just wanted to thank you for your service and thank the service of the Honolulu Fire Department as well. Thank you. It's our pleasure, sir. Anybody else from the board? I'll Question. So, I'm sorry, who? Yes, Henry. Henry, where's Henry? Lost. Okay, the question is oh, what, lost. Percentage, All right. what percentage is um, from cell phone, tablets, um, use anyway? Are there technologies that allow us to track to see if 
a cell phone usage or tablet usage cause an accident? Um, it's, it's not really a, uh, there's not something that we have that we can track, but a lot of times for these accidents, um, if people end up being unconscious and that sort of thing, or, or unable to respond when officers get there, they'll find the phone still on a call or still open to a particular web page or that sort of thing. So, um, we do, we do see it a lot. What percentage may I ask? They usually, they usually tending, they're tending to lump it together into inattention. Um, when we keep stats, it's usually for when we're citing, and in in the in the situations where there's an accident, we don't necessarily cite. Um, so they usually they they lump it all into the inattention to driving. I mean, what percentage is cell phone abuse? Because when I roll up next to a vehicle. Mm -hmm. About 60% has some phone close by them where they're looking at it at a stoplight. Yeah, the, the state law, I mean, the state law states that it has to be in their, in their possession. So actually physically held in their hand. If they have it hands free where it's mounted, that that's supposed to be okay. But we still, uh, nowadays cell phone technology It'll like my cell phone, it'll black out the screen if it senses I'm driving, but not everybody enacts that um, feature. So, um, unfortunately, it's, it's something that's integrated into our lives now, and a lot of people rely on it. I do as well, but um, the best option is to have it um, hands free mounted somewhere where you can look at it without having to take your eyes necessarily take your eyes off of the road. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem. Thank Mr. you. Thank you, Henry. Henry, I hope that we see you next uh, next meeting down here. Huh? You live right nearby. <laughs> any uh, any questions from the audience? If not, uh, HPD, thank you very much. Uh, Board of Water Supply, do you want to wait till their presentation, or you want to give something separately? Um. Oh, hi. I'm online today. Sorry, I couldn't make it down tonight. Oh, Iris. Iris, all right. Hi, got I can read it down now. here. Go yeah, ahead, Iris. I wanted to be with them. Okay, well, just wanted to read on the main break reports on August 1st, we had near uh, an inch near 1425 Mamalu Street on August 14th, the six inch main near 36 Bates Street on August 15th. There was an eight inch main near 707 Wiley Street. And on August 22nd, there was a four inch main near 1203 Eleven Drive. So that's the main break report for the August. And I just have one general water announcement. So the Board of Water Supply will observing will be observing Source Protection Week from September 24th through September 30th. The goal is to bring awareness about the importance of protecting our precious water sources, your drinking water sources, excuse me. So while Oahu's water purely comes from groundwater resources, here's some basic ways you can hashtag protect the source. You can conserve and use water efficiently, you can check and repair leaks regularly, use only what you need and don't waste it. You can properly dispose of household waste, don't pour it on the ground. You can protect watersheds, you can stay in designated trails and respect wildlife and join a community watershed partnership group. So with the closure of the three of our three water sources near Red Hill, we all need to be responsible stewards to ensure we'll have an adequate supply of safe drinking water today and for future generations. So go to our website, the board of water supply.com slash source for more information. So let's all do our part and make every drop count. So that was my fast announcement and I'll be hanging around to listen to the, the presentation later on. If there's any questions. Any questions from the board? Any for the public? Not Iris. Nice seeing you Thank again. You. you can Thank you can you. always come down. You can always know. come down and join us at my mind. I was tonight. I wasn't feeling well. Sorry, but next month I'll be there. All right. Great. Thanks. Your smiling face. <laughs> All right. Uh, we do have some vacancies. Um, a vacancy in subdistrict one which is, uh, I guess, I guess it's up in Pu'u Nunui, and then vacancies in 
subdistrict four and five, and I'm looking at my map, four and five is sort of down near the, where is it, Judd Street area, that area? Yeah. Judd, anyone interested in filling? Anyone interested? Okay. Okay, moving right along. Uh, resident concerns. Anybody have some resident concerns that they want to share with us? And by the way, we have a very long agenda, so if you can you know, make whatever your comments or reports short, appreciate it. Any resident concerns? Uh, I think I got you done, Robert, um, under new business, so you can wait then. Okay. Anybody else that's not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, if not, let's... Uh, Item number five, reports of members at, at attendance and the other meetings. Anybody went to any meetings they want to share with us? Any? Yes. Donald. Is that on? Oh, yes. Um, I attended a meeting on the neighborhood plan. Yeah, it's on your agenda. Donald. And... Donald. Oh. It, it was on the agenda in your July 10th neighborhood board. It was hosted by Robert Armstrong, and th this is the neighborhood plan. The thing is that um, I attended, and I was very disappointed because we have 39 neighborhood boards, and there were only about 12 people, three from Kailua, two from Waimanalo, and one from uh, 15th neighborhood board. And of course, um, the chair was there. Um, it was very disappointing because, you know, the neighborhood board plan, if you look at it, this is the plan. And it's 2008. And I'm going to tell you right now, this plan has to be revised because the community has grown, and there are places where there are all so-called uh, non-committal people. In other words, at large people. That is uh, so-called not a sub-district, but take the uh, neighborhood board 18. There are 13 at large people. Can you imagine 13? And none of them has a so-called responsibility. And, and I feel that this is wrong because if you look at that area, this is the so-called Kalikai area. You got Mayor Wright Housing, you got uh, Kuhio Park Terrace. You know, there are so many people and just recently, the Palolo um, um, community, which is the public housing, voiced an opinion that, hey, they want to be represented. But if the neighborhood plan does not identify sub-districts or, or make sub-districts, you know, why are we here? Why are we here? You know, we are here to get input. We are here to, to get state and city people to listen to the problems that our neighbor has and try to resolve it. But if 39 <laughs> neighborhood don't even send one representative, you know, it, it's very disgraceful as far as I'm concerned. I went because I want this neighborhood plan to work because it does have all the so-called opportunity where the neighbor can voice an opinion. And we, as a board, will get this voice open. Because if he or she calls the city and county or the city, that's one person. And you know for a fact that one person, the city and county and the state, will just push it on the side and, you know, carry on. That's why I'm very, very, you know, adamant about this neighborhood plan. And 
we are going to re reconvene and about four months from now. And hopefully we can come back and so-called update the plan and make changes to the plan where it will fit what we have today, not 2008. No, no, I want to thank you for going to that. Uh, I, I know we have all that invitation. Uh, so you said in four months, they're going to do something? Well, in four months, um, we broke up into three groups. And the three groups, there's an art, there was an article in the newspaper. And the three groups are neighborhood plan and neighborhood boundaries and the neighborhood commission. Those three are the items that they want to work on. And I agree with them because like I said, and, and I don't believe anybody or you guys have read this plan. Okay. Saying that, you know, yeah. you asked me. To... So there'll be a notice at the ne of the next meeting then in re yes. regard to that. I'll try. Yeah. Well, well, keep us posted. Actually, I would encourage if you are interested to do go and join. I know Bob. Bob, you know, took the initiative to try and do something in regard to a neighborhood board. So, thanks a lot, Don. And keep us posted. Any questions for Don? Don, thank you. Uh, anybody else attend any meetings that may be of interest to our board? Okay, moving right along. Um, <clears throat> Ompa, Ompo, is Cora out there? No, okay, we'll pass. All right, uh, we do have our representative from the city, Edward. So I'm one of those short Asian guys, yeah? <laughs> Hello, out your phone. Uh, members of neighborhood board 14 um, for our, on behalf of the mayor um, you can find his newsletter on one oahu.org um, but in this, this month's newsletter he have a message from the mayor on the lahaina tragedy um, and what you can do to help basically mayor's um, endorsing some of the bigger um, organizations for folks to donate to and organize their efforts on anything any kind of response for lahaina or any of the victims of the Maui wildfire. So the big organizations include like Hawaii Community Foundation, Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, or the Food Bank. Um, next up on the newsletter, there was a first new lifeguard tower installed in 11 years at Kahi Power Point. Um, expands a total of 42 life tower, lifeguard towers across the island. And immediately after they were staffed and it was open, two hours later, the first rescue happened on that beach. So something that needed some attention out there on the west, west side of the island. Also in the newsletter, you can read about the Honolulu Liquor Commission's new administrator, Sal Patilos. He's a longtime industry leader who joined us from Utah, but he's a local boy with some local roots here. So had an opportunity to come back home and head up the Liquor Commission. Um, next up on the newsletter is um, Mayor's follow through on you know, bringing Verona Village, which is out there on the Eva Plain. Something that was a longstanding promise that the city had made to those um, former ag workers in that community. Um, and so that's, so the city's going to be working with Pierce Savio and Habitat for Humanity to redevelop the historic village and add on a number of new homes to that area. Next up, um, Forbes Magazine has once again named City and County of Honolulu as one of the best workplaces in the state. Um, and finally, I'm uh, sad to announce the retirement of Mary Lewis, a longtime administrator for the Blaze Down Waikiki Shell Venues. Um, she has more than 30 years of public service and um, during that time, able to engage a number of local, national, and international clients um, and host them over there at those venues and provide a wide range of entertainment, athletic, expo, cultural, and educational events. So, um, wish Mar Mary the best of luck in her next part, next part of her life, and but definitely thankful for her contributions to the city. Other than that, I think I missed last. Last month's meeting with some vertigo, um, but there was a number of items that that 
for follow-up that I do have a lot of follow-up to provide to you guys. So first up, um, missing street sign on Kula Street uh, at the intersection of Kula and Lolena Streets. So that one has a Division of Road Maintenance of DFM has a service request number 49934 to have those signs replaced. Uh, the work will be scheduled once the signs have been fabricated and re when resources, re resources are available to get out there. Um, next up, we had a report of a sidewalk maintenance issue, and this is where the sidewalk fell, out, fell into the storm drain area over there at Hanai Loop and Kealia Drive. I know that's a tough one because that's if, when that part's kind of blocked, the water instead of going down that storm drain heads down Kapalaba Ave, and that's where it gets really steep. Yeah. So um, again, we got a service request number five zero four two two, and they'll catch that repair that basin lip, and hopefully they get that squared away well before the wet season starts here. Although I know we got some rain tonight. Um, next up, we have a crosswalk repainting. I was identified for repainting by the neighborhood board meeting last month at Kokia and North School Street. That's faded. Um, so that one, DFM reports that Department of Transportation Services, DTS, in the, has indicated to DFM for their records that that, that mid-block crosswalk was abolished and abandoned. So that said, you know, there's no plans to repaint that one. If anybody has some concerns, I'm more than happy to take that back for the Department of Transportation Services um, to indicate why. But usually reasons why they don't, um, why they would abolish it and abandon the crosswalk would be just low usage and um, just low usage in that area. But if there's a concern and there's um, information to the contrary, more than happy to raise the issue with Department of Transportation Services. Next up, I had a um, lane restriping in two areas, Nu'uwanu Avenue and Liliha Street. I will take back the um, exact areas is what DFM uh, came back to us with. I think when we raised the issue up to DFM, we didn't have enough information on exact areas. One of the things that DFM identified for me was that there are a number of infrastructure projects going on. Department of Water or ENV are doing um, different infrastructure projects in, in the neighborhood. So they want to make sure that, you know, before they do it, you know, is the contractor that did the work in those areas, if it is affected, were they supposed to repaint it? And if they were supposed to repaint it, they'll work that with those contractors to repaint it. If not, more than happy to do it, but they want to get those areas kind of nailed down so they can hold the right people accountable for what their contracts that they're supposed to do, but we know there's a lot of work going in on those areas. Next up, I had um, on my list here abandoned vehicles, particularly in the areas of Kealia and Kunia Drive. Um, there were two identical, two vehicles identified by HPD. One had license plate PYE 318. It was marked for abandoned, but subsequently, um, when they went to go take a look at it, the car moved. So couldn't take action on that one. But there was a second vehicle, uh, license plate JVZ710, um, also marked on August 22nd. They did kind of go back in 24 hours. Car did not move. That one is flagged and will be towed away by the Department of Community Services as an abandoned. Oh, Carol says it's been towed since the update was provided to us from HPD. So um, then that one was a white Toyota Sienna. Um, HPD also, yeah, also had a concern for HPD um, relate, relative to speed enforcement in the area of St. Francis Hospital on Liliha Street. So from August 22 to 29, um, District 5 HPD operated a speed laser on Liliha Street near St. Francis. During the operation, during that week, no speeding violations were observed. Um, so they indicated it would help police to, prompt, to be promptly notified by having the constituent immediately call 911 at the time of the possible violation. Maybe they can kind of go back and kind of do that do an operation at those specific times and hopefully identify, you know, anybody speeding and make that a lot safer area for everybody. Related to the speed issue on St. Francis Hospital, um, also inquiry was made to Department of Transportation Services on whether we can install a speed table or some kind of speed hump in that area to, uh, as, a, as a traffic calming measure. Um, DTS is open to evaluate the need of speed humps in Lilia Street in that area. Um, and what, they're, what they do in that study is make sure that they have in here the geometrics of the roadway, traffic speeds and volumes, number of travel lanes and surrounding development um, won't be adversely impacted. 
what that means sometimes, right? So if you have a little ramp in there and the guy's speeding, they're not going to go airborne and go into somebody's house, right? They might go into the wall if it's just on the, on the curb, but if they had a little ramp, they might end up in the front yard or somebody's front door. So that's kind of what the ge 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 um, geometrics of the roadway and those kind of speed studies that they're going to do there. Um, but they will take a look at it. If there's more means, I mean, they're not going to stop at um, a speed table or speed hump. If that doesn't work in that area, they'll kind of consider other means. But the first thing is to do, the, to do that study. Um, and they also work with, they usually work with HPD as far as incidents and um, incidents to get that information. Uh, but that's all I had on my list. Sorry I missed last month's meeting. If there's anything else I missed, happy to take on the information. You know, first of all, I want to congratulate you and thank you for being very responsive, even though you were missing the last meeting. And uh, I, I got to admit to, to our, our residents that, you know, the city's been very responsive to our concerns. And, and I want to thank our city representative, Ed. He does, leave, he does live in the area, too, by the way. <laughs> I, I cross through the area every day to take my son to school. So. <laughs> you know, since we got you here, Ed, and so you don't have to stick around, we do have some items on the agenda. I'm going to go through them and maybe whoever is, you know, interested in that particular uh, item, you can um, actually tell it in regards to your concern. I'm going to go down the list under uh, our agenda. <clears throat> uh, in regards to Holla Drive and 2037 and 1532 Hanai, I'm going to wait. because Gerald, you're going to be giving a report on that. So. Uh, we'll let him to give that report, even though it says city rep. Uh, there was one 11.1 .1 lane restriping on half tailing freeway to Hillcrest Street. Who's that was uh, Carol? You want to? There's a. You you put that in right. You said that they're looking at it and they're they're uh, they're checking it out, right? So what was raised? Um, internally with us was Lilia Street and Uwanu, so not off dealing oh. but we can add that to the list. Okay, yeah, I gave it two months ago okay. to Spencer exactly what I, it is, but it's um, Mackay bound, the last block before the freeway, and then Malka bound up from School Street to Hillcrest. Yep, yep. Excuse me, Carol, we did actually follow up on that last month in the minutes. It, uh, goes about markings along School Street, uh, restriping of faded pavement markings on half tailing from the freeway to Hillcrest. Work is expected to be completed by the end of October 2023. You want to keep this on the agenda, wait until it's finished, or is it is that a done deal? It's done deal. All right, thank you. Uh, item number 11.2, uh, uh, cars blocking bus on Lilia near Judd Street. Whose was that? Pudding? All right, I'm going to cross that out. Um, painting, oh, this is mine. <clears throat> Mamalo Street. Okay, if you go. I'm familiar with the area. Cheerful. Yeah, all right. If you go up and then you go through Mamalo or turn right to continue on the Leva Drive, there's a, it's, you got to go over this berm, yeah. right? Poor visibility coming it, up over that bird. It right? is scary, like, mm, because some some people want to park on the right hand side, and you're coming over, and you don't see that car. I've seen some near accidents, and I don't know why you, they gave a building permit to. There's a house across the right across the street. Guys are parking over there, but you know, getting trying to come out. So my recommendation is put a red, um, you know, painted red from the beginning of Mamalo all the way down to the first house. And also some of the neighbors there said there's, they like, they love to speed. Well, you know, if you go over the hill, you go, whoosh, right? I don't know how you're gonna s slow them down. Well, I, I told her that, but I told her I'd tell you, <laughs> see what you can do. I don't know what you can do about that. So just so I'm clear, so it's Mamalo Street, you can, this is where you can have that steep hill coming up. Uh, you can continue uh, right Mamalo, on. Whatever, Mamalo whatever going drive, Malka. Right? Mal yeah. Yeah, the beginning of uh, Mamala going Malka, you go up and you come down. I would say paint that whole red, uh, that whole curbing red until that first driveway okay. on the right. And that'll pro prohibit people from parking there. I mean, it's a blind. 
I'm, I'm, it, it's an accident waiting to happen. Okay. Uh, and this, as for the speed, well, I'll leave that one up to you. I don't know what you can do. I, I don't know why anybody would do that. Like I said, it's such a blind area. I think the neighbor said, area, put, put, a, put a, what do you call it, a speed bump? I said, you're really going to. Yeah, I know. That's part of the geometric story of the roadway and safe yeah. travel speeds. Anyway, I, I told you that, so I, I, Got I it. want to get in trouble with my neighbor. All right. Uh, let's see. We already did that. Oh, last one. I got an email from one of the residents up at Leva Heights. Uh, all of us up there know about Napoyo Park. It is a passive park, but it seems like uh, this um, young couple have kids, and it says, "Why can't we have playground equipment?" So I is any particular per is that person here tonight? No. Okay. Well, I'll just give that to you. But just for your information, that Napoyo Park, actually, when I first moved them out 50 years ago, it was actually vacant land owned by the Kia State. And Budget Realty uh, bought that acreage, and they were going to build um, cluster homes around the, the edge. And the neighbors got it together and said, no, can't do that. It's going to be too much traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they, the city condemned it. So for 20 years, they didn't do anything. Then finally, after 20 years, the city said, let's make a park. And so they came up, which is very nice of them, and asked the residents, what kind of park do you want? Okay. For those of you who haven't been up to Napoya Park, it's, you know, right? it's a very nice park. And by the way, if you <laughs> tell everybody this. If you go up there, you can take a picture of Diamond Head, uh, Punchbowl, and the city. Don't tell everybody that. We've got all these tourists coming up. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, and by the way, they cut down the shrubbery, not by the city. It's the neighbors. But they did a, they did a poll, and the greater majority of the residents up there wanted a passive park. I wanted a swimming pool, a basketball court, et cetera, you know, tennis courts. <laughs> cut that out. So now they want playground equipment. There is no playground equipment. I'm just going to give that issue to you. And you can, you know, unless someone's going to push that issue, I, I think, you know, because of the, uh, the demographics of, of that area, the most, a lot of them are senior citizens. And, and I guess the word is maybe they don't want, well, anyway, the neighbor said you can look into it. Chair Fong, actually, um, Napuel Park is joint custody between Department of Parks and Recreation as well as Community Services, so my department. Yeah. At one time, we did have a senior center operating up there. My great-grandmother was actually a participant in that program. She lived up in uh, Level Heights, so very familiar with that area. Yeah, it was, a, it was a Alzheimer's. Yep, and, memory center. Yeah, and everybody was worried. I said, Alzheimer's guy's not going to bother anybody. Anyway, that was an, uh, one of the items that they wanted to bring up. So you can give a report on that one way or another. You can ask parks, and they may say no because of, you know, unless there's a push by the residents, but I bring it up anyway. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Anybody else have anything else for the city? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, thank you for coming down. I want to um, respond to the Kokea crosswalk. Um, if you could pass this to DTS, because the reason I brought it up again is because they left the um, purse crosswalk, the crosswalk sign, the diamond. It's still at that crosswalk. So for me, I was under the interpretation that it wasn't abolished because I heard that maybe one year ago that they did abolish it, in fact. Um, as for the usage, I know that it's a crosswalk for two bus stops, too, and one of the bus stops is right here by the Hawaii Public Housing Authority mm -hmm. property as well as um, below the Lanakila housing. So in regards to usage, it might possibly be a high use crosswalk. If that might be something DHS could take a look at, please. Thank you. Sorry, are there, cross, are there bus stops on either side of that crosswalk? Yes. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. So on both on the EVA and the Diamond Head sides of it. Got it. I'll have that included for DTS for their consideration. Oh, before I forget, under item number 11.7, sewer leak, I see uh, our neighbor, Robert Lau. Um, I'm going to ask Robert if he can take 
the, the mic, since we have our city rep here, I don't know if it, it's for the city rep or the BWS, but, but since we got the city rep here, uh, before he leaves, then at least you can. If it's a sewer leak, it'll probably fall under environmental services. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say again. With it either way. If it's a sewer leak, that's environmental services that does trash as well as um, wastewater. Okay, then why don't we have Rob? Come, come Robert, give your, your concern and then uh, maybe uh, Ed can take care of it. Okay, yeah, my name is Robert. Uh, I live up in the Leva, and the reason I'm here is uh, to report there's a sewer leak that's ongoing. Okay, so. I took a picture. It's actually pooling in my neighbor, leaking through her walls, and then it's pooling into her uh, plant area, and it's actually leaking into our area. Yeah, so I'll just pass the, the thing back. Okay, so that kind of reminds me back when I was a kid, and then uh, we used to go uh, bird hunting on, uh, close to a dairy farm. And the dairy farmer wanted us to come to, you know, hunt the birds. And then the, the one thing I remember is that you, you can, I, you, could, you couldn't see the dairy as we were going to it, but you could smell it. But the thing is, I smell this every day. And this has been ongoing for the last uh, probably six weeks now. Okay, so we reported it to the city, the health department, and uh, the response I got from the city was kind of interesting. I tried to uh, make a complaint, and they told me I cannot. And the reason being is they said that I have to get the approval from the person that's actually doing it to go on their properties to see. I said, but there's, uh, there's raw sewage on the ground. So anyway, my neighbor has been working with the city and the department here. But the problem is there's a house that's actually in violation uh, that's causing the leak. And it was built back in 19, oh, nine, not 19, 2021. And then there's a easement through my neighbor's property, uh, a sewer easement, and then that's actually causing all of the problems. Okay, uh, and then I'll just pass this along. Yeah. So the thing is, yeah, uh, we've been trying to get this thing resolved, and uh, everybody's coming out, taking a look at it. Yeah, there's our leak, but uh, nothing has been done so far uh, to I guess, uh, do anything with the homeowner that's causing the problem to get it fixed. So that's why we're here. So the thing is, what we'll like is the DPP to issue a notice of violation, like, hey, please fix it. And we, as well, residents, don't want this to end up like Richard's Lane that's been lasting for years and years and years. And so the thing is, I get up every day and I'm thinking, am I close to a... Uh, dairy farm because I smell it every single day. So if you could uh, get something done, that would be really great for us. You can also tell them that you've already contacted our council member and also the city and right. they haven't done anything. Ed, maybe uh, you could talk to Ed after this and give mm -hmm. more of the details. I'm going to leave this on the agenda and see what they can do with it. That's ridiculous. Okay. I mean, every day you smell it? Yes, yes. And then the unfortunate thing is uh, we're downwind from everybody. So that's why we oh. feel it every day. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, you, you want to take, come up and. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. All right. Okay. Did you, you hear that? Okay. Oh, thank you. You heard that, Ed? Okay. Yeah. So, thank yeah. You. So if we could get some kind of. Uh, notice of violations so we can actually get them to start doing something and yeah the well we we got yeah. the man here so yeah we'll get something done yeah and one last thing the the thing that uh, uh since the thing has been been built in 19, uh, 19 2021 this is the second time this has happened uh there was another break uh further up yeah so something is going on yeah. okay well i'm going to leave it on the agenda yeah. and then ed you can move it right back um brandon Thank you so much for calling our office and allowing us to help. We have the deputy director of planning and permitting here as well. So maybe we can talk story with him um, during the meeting or after the meeting. And that way we can specifically key in and he can go in and, and apply um, his um, oversight on this as well as investigate that particular neighbor that you're talking about that has, that has had this problem before. 
So it's great that you came to the neighborhood board and the deputy director was kind enough to come to also give reports about other monster homes so we can have a powwow with him face to face right here. Anybody else from the board? Is the, Donald. Is it on public property or private property? Okay, you know, give him, they can't do anything. It's private property. He cannot do anything on private property. The only way you can do it is you have to go to court. Yeah. Well, the thing is that if it's on private property, the city and county, even the state, they won't touch it. That is private property. You know, Don, why don't we let that uh, leave that up to Ed and let the, the city make the determination. If not, they can do what's necessary. Okay, thanks, Ed. Robert, thank you. Anybody else? Oh. Okay, thank you. Let's wait, go. wait, wait. I'm not finished yet. Oh, go ahead, Don. The city uh, on the Puhaku uh, crosswalk. You say you live in our area. You know uh, the crosswalk we're talking about? Because like you said, we have bus stops on two sides of the road. And also on the road, there was team saying that, that was, uh, you come into a crosswalk. Are you guys gonna remove that um, thing? Because the thing is right now, it identifies there's a crosswalk. And the question is, I don't know who made the so-called survey, because every time I catch the bus, people get off at that bus stop and they cross the street. And the other thing is that there's no other crosswalk maybe 200 yards away. You expect the person to walk 200, miles, um, two, two, 200 yards to use the crosswalk in front of the um, senior citizen place or in front of uh, Helena's, I mean, uh, I, I don't buy your justification because the thing is that that crosswalk has been there for so long. Because why do you mark the cross street saying that there's a crosswalk when now you're telling it's not necessary? I mean, I don't, I, I don't agree with that statement. And can we have the person who made the survey come and talk to us and explain to us why the crosswalk is going to be demolished? I mean, I mean, because even our council person, he has that on his list about the crosswalk. When, when Brendan comes on board, I'm going to ask him the same question. He has it on his list on August. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I will take it back to DTS for further consideration. You know, and what I'm going to do, and Don, I'm going to put it in the agenda for next the next meeting, and I'm going to put uh, crosswalk of Kakea Street, Kokea, and, okay. and then somebody come and explain. I mean, if Don has a concern, I'm sure others have concern. Why did they eliminate it? Okay, yeah. Carol. When we did the complete streets on that section of School Street was pointed out that that's one of the major cross rocks on that section because of the bus stops on either side and many people crossed there. So that was, it was what was re recommended was flashing, the flashing lights um, that people could activate to cross there. I'll put it in agenda. Thanks, Dan, Don and uh, Carol. Okay. Anybody from the public? So if you bring somebody in and say, how come it's eliminated? I guess you got the drift that I think they want to have it. Anybody else? Anything else uh, on the agenda that you, in the board before I say good night to Ed? Any help from the public? Thanks, Ed, great job, appreciate it. Tell over the mirror for us. Oh, there. Uh, our council member. Uh. Thank you so much for allowing us to present tonight. Uh, Brandon Mitsuda on behalf of council member Tyler Dos Santos Tam, who represents you in council district six. This is a copy of our district six update. So I'll have you all read that. I don't want to belabor. I know that our meeting is very long tonight. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two things on the update. So the first thing is that council member has really prioritized 
the laws against game rooms. He does not want game rooms to come back into our district, specifically the ones on Liliha Street. And what we've done is that we are working on legislation that will focus in on the landlords of these game rooms and put higher civil fines and penalties on these landlords. We also want to authorize the Department of Planning and Permitting and the Honolulu Police Department and other city personnel to be able to enforce certain provisions of the building and construction code. This dovetails into the third part of it, which is a resolution on coordination that brings all of our departments together so they can uh, enforce fire as well as zoning codes working with the Honolulu Police Department. We want to make it easier for everybody to make sure that these game rooms do not come back. Uh, the second thing is Bill 44 regarding monster homes, and this is what Deputy Director Sumada is so nice to come to our meeting here to talk to us about tonight. Uh, basically, what it does is that it, it attacks people that make false statements to our inspectors. So if our inspectors go up and they say, no, no, no problem here, everything's all good, and that's a false statement, then at our next meeting, which is tomorrow, we're going to be discussing penalties for people that habitually make those false statements and those penalties could include higher fines demolition or the prohibition on submitting new building permit applications for a certain amount of time but we're working very closely with the deputy director on that and i'm sure he also has some thoughts on it as well i uh, wanted to let you know that uh, we have a call for interns so the last uh, sheet here is anybody interested in interning at our council offices to please contact our office and then wanted to let you know about two things we're working on for uh, Carol uh, she called us about the broken grate on Konia and hoftailing and so we're having the departments working on that for you as well as we got a request uh, for speeding on Lulena Street by Aleva neighborhood park uh, by Natsunoya tea house Vehicles are speeding up and down there all the time, and we're having the police go up there and enforce and having the departments take a look at what other measures we can to slow those drivers down. So that's our report tonight. And then also we have the deputy director of planning and permitting here. So if you want him to give you an update on those three properties uh, that are suspected monster homes, then he can do that. We'll hold off on that under uh, old business. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, by the way, this is my understanding that under Bill 44, isn't there a state law in regards to false statements? Isn't it a duplication of law or effort? I don't know if it's specifically dealing with these monster homes. That's why this bill is focusing in on that. Uh, when they make false statements to city inspectors when they go up, that's the challenge. You know, people lie all the time. And we're trying to let them know that if you lie, you will get higher penalties. It works. That's fine. It's just too bad we can't get rid of the old, the monster homes. Because I think the mayor said, oh, we like to, but we can't. It's already been approved by the building permit, of the DPP. So, you know, it's legit. It's a question of use. That they're, I, don't, I don't want to steal uh, Gerald's thunder. He's going to explain that. So, again. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Donald. Um, Brandon, you know, in your August report, uh, the council report, first of all, I would like to thank you for oh, the council, councilman for the sidewalk installation on Judge Street. Um, it's been an on ongoing problem. But the, uh, I have a couple of questions on that. You don't mention where does the sidewalk start? Is it going to start at Lanakilo? Lilio? We know it's going to end up on Nuano Street. And the other question I have is, are we going to have both sides, Mauka and Maokai, for a sidewalk, or are we going to have only one side? I would like to know, and can you tell us um what's the, uh, the sidewalk going to be on the Mauka or Makai side and also can we have a date when this project is supposed to start because according to on your um memo 
you said the councilman get, got two million fifteen fifteen thousand dollars for a couple of the projects. So um, can we get a better idea on the sidewalk for Judge Street? And the other one is also on School Street. Uh, I walk School Street and I, I know the sidewalk's got to be repaired, but I, I don't know about any uh, area that it does not have a sidewalk. So can, can I have a clarification? And can you go back and tell the Council of uh, Pohaku Street crosswalk that it's going to be deleted? Because it's also on your list of accomplishment. And according to this, you have the funding. Thank you. Thank you for that, Donna. We'll follow up and get back to you in coordination with our city rep. Donald, in regards to crosswalk, they're eliminating one on Kokea Street. You want to put the one on Street, too? You want an explanation on that since they're at it? Well, it's, it's up to the board as far as I'm concerned. Okay, um, okay, okay. We'll just leave it, Kokea. Thanks, thanks, Don. Any other questions from the board? Any questions from the audience? None? We'll move right along. Uh, Senator Rhodes, Representative. Hi, hello. I'm on. I'm on the uh, Hi, Carl. On How are you? I take it you can hear me. That's good. Um, let's see what I got for you tonight. Um, so, as most of you are aware, the uh, the state and the county have um, teamed up to put in red light uh, cameras at certain intersections, and I just want to go through those intersections real quick. They're there you can now get a ticket there. It's no no longer any warnings anywhere. So those intersections are vineyard. Boulevard and Palama Vineyard and Liliha Vineyard and Nuuanu, Pali and Vineyard, Pali and School, Vike Lique and School, King Street and Ward, Kapiolani and Kamakee, Baratania and Pee Koi and McCulley and Algaroba. So as you drive through there, be careful because they're hot. Uh, I think I saw someone from DOT there, so maybe they're going to go into this in more detail and correct any mistakes I make here. But the last information I have is that um, night work began again on August 20, and the road work dates have slightly changed. So now Monday through Friday, uh, this is for the Poly Highway, sorry, for the Poly Highway reconstruction. Uh, the road work dates have changed slightly to occur on Monday through Friday nights from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. Sunday nights will be reserved for emergency work or rescheduled work caused by rainouts. Night work in this area is expected to be completed by the end of November, and there is a hotline number for uh, night work, uh, road work hotline. It's 348-5168. That's 348-5168 if there are any problems with the, the night work on the poly. I was recently asked for input on the Board of Water Supply Supplies proposed new Uanu managed aquifer recharge and hydroelectric project which will encompass New Uana Reservoir number four down to reservoir number one. Um, the, the piping, I guess, goes along Old Poly Road and New Uana Poly Drive. The project proposes diversion of surface water runoff into an existing reservoir in the New Uana <laughs> Valley to increase recharge of the groundwater supplies for drinking water while also generating renewable hydroelectric energy. This project will help enhance the island's irreplace irreplaceable groundwater resources meet statewide water sustainability and uh, renewable energy goals while improving dam safety and flood control at the new Luana Reservoir. I believe this is money that I helped get a few years ago. They we got some special purpose revenue bonds to work on the dam um, at number one, I guess it was. And hopefully this is part of that. So my input included support for the project, but a reminder to make sure that the community's opinions and feedback are taken into consideration. I also voiced my concern that the project should attempt to minimize disruption and maintain a high level of safety for the residents, commuters, and pedestrians that will be affected by the noise and construction. We've, uh, New Guano Valley residents have been living through um, Poly Highway for a long time, so it would be nice to have some peace and quiet, if at all possible. <laughs> Turning to COVID, the Department of Health reported 840 new COVID cases last week with a seven-day average of 129 cases and six deaths. Uh, COVID is still a top 10 uh, cause of death in the country and has claimed the lives of more than 1.1 million Americans. 
I strongly encourage you to get your shots and boosters. A new booster should be available by the end of the month and maybe as early as this week. I just saw a news report after we had sent the report in, this report in, uh, saying that uh, it's received initial approval and it might be available by the end of the week. Um, I, I also encourage you to wear masks again, at least for a while, uh, inside with large crowds, because there's definitely been a spike recently here in Hawaii, and uh, you know the, it's still circulating. Also, flu shots are now available. Generally, the flu is not as dangerous as COVID, but it's still unpleasant to get, and flu will help. The flu shot will help you um, avoid that, and they are now available. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me just echo what uh, Senator Rhodes said. Actually, there is a. I think there's a new strain of COVID. This is a new boost that w that was encouraged to take, and they did encourage uh, masks. So I'm not going to mandate. It's up to you, the board. But uh, you know, it's caution if nothing else. Uh, um, any questions for Senator Rhodes? Yes. Senator Rhodes, um, this Lilio Kalani Garden, the yes. homeless, is that part of your district? It is. Okay, because the thing is that I, I see the representative has this uh, task about the homeless. And as far as I know, Representative Ono, on when he was the representative, he had the same task. Can you tell me what's the problem and can you help the representative get, get this thing Oh, Yes, because absolutely. No, we, uh, to, um, Representative Ono and I had sort of, we, we sort of split tasks. So he was running lead on that and I was helping, signing, signing all the letters, helping with anything that he wanted help on. And of course the offer is there for Representative Takanuchi too. Um, but she has been point on it, just sort of inherited, inherited it from uh, Representative Ono. But yes, it's definitely a concern. I've met with community groups. I've, um, contacted the right people at city and state to try to uh, get some help. I've also introduced bills because there's this jurisdictional issue between people that people leave the city property in the park and then go down underneath the freeway and sometimes the police won't do anything there. So I have introduced bills on that issue. They, they haven't passed yet, but it's still definitely an issue. Because under the bridge is state. Under right. the bridge is state. And then, of course, on the other side of the bridge is county again. So that's right. Yeah. Because I, I've, I've seen so called the homeless wash their clothes in the river, hang their clothes on the uh, chain link fence. And, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, we need to get this thing resolved because I have a couple friends that live in the condos and they still have a problem with those people knocking at the door 12 o'clock, one o'clock at night, you know, because they think that the residents uh, turned, you know, turned them into the authorities. But um, I would like to see this thing resolved because it's, it's been going on for so long. I mean, you know, there, there must be a solution. And I thank you for, you know, helping the representative to get this thing resolved. Thank you. I'll do my best. There's unfortunately, there's a number of areas, especially down in the lower part of my district to, below the freeway that, uh, you know, it's, it's an ongoing struggle, but it, yes, it's, a, it's the highest priority and we'll continue to work on it. Thanks. Uh, Senator Rhodes, my understanding was, my understanding is actually that representative Taki Anucci is the lead on this, right? Well, she, you, she's you, yeah she's she's been the one who's been point and i've been and to um representative ono before her was also the point on it and i like i say i've played i've played an active role but it hasn't been sometimes we sort of split up tasks whoever got started on it first would would run well, run interference for the other but for the progress report or status report should i leave uh, representative takenochi as the point yeah, chair, you can leave me. Uh, you can leave me on. Okay, yeah, and and you know, I, I want to echo what Donald said. This this has been on the agenda since Ono. I mean, even before that, and we've got to get this resolved. Um, and I know some people who do live in that area. So anyway, we'll wait for your report. Uh, Senator Rhodes, thank you. Any questions from the board, from the audience? 
Okay, if not, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Have a good evening. Senator Kim. Senator Kim. Hi, good evening. My name is Nadia Garcia from the office of Senator Kim. Um, quickly, I'd like to address something uh, Senator Rhodes pointed out that indeed, Shelly Kumishige from the Department of Transportation is here. Uh, Senator Kim asked if she might make herself available to provide follow up to some of the questions raised from the last meeting. So, uh, if that's all right, I will go ahead and give my important announcements and then yield the time to Shelly. So, the community report has been distributed to the chair and members. However, if you'd like to receive a copy, please add your uh, email address to the chat there or go ahead and uh, send that to me. And I can be sure to consolidate you with our list we have. Concerns have been raised regarding the protocols in place for the community in the midst of a natural disaster. And uh, so, concerns have been brought to Senator Kim's attention and she's inquired with DLNR's Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And um, we found that there is a community wildlife protection plan uh, that is available. However, it's uh, usually initiated by the community is community and geographically based and uh, it's critical and yet there's no record of such a plan in place for district 14 and so uh, we as a community are initiating such a plan now there will be an update to come at the next meeting and if i may um, hand it over to shelly thank you thank you nadia hi um let me sorry i'm going to turn on my video um, hi, I'm Shelly Kunishige with the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, Senator Kim's office had asked for updates on the no right turn on school um, on school street onto Liki Liki Kalihi. So, I believe um, as we reported through Senator's office previously, we did an assessment in March. Um, and our, at the time, our engineers did not find any significant safety concerns with folks turning onto Lulani Street um, and Hernandez and continuing um, on their front to Kalihi Street. So they did observe at the time 252 vehicles making the right hand turn from School Street onto Leilani and 177 observed in the PM peak. So they um, the two suggest possible options to reduce the number of vehicles using Leilani and Hernandez to access um, Kalihi Street are either restricting access to Kalihi Street from Hernandez, which is within our con state control, or requesting the city implement a no right turn restriction during peak from eastbound North School Street onto Leilani Street. So that would be sort of a matching um, to the existing no left turn from um, School Street onto Leilani Street. And then on the Poly Highway um, resurfacing, so we did receive the question of whether or not this meets federal guidelines as it, um, as it is a federal aid project, it does need to meet the requirements of the Federal Highway Administration. But if there are any specific concerns, please let us know and uh, we can respond to them. Then the next question we had was the status of the Nu'uwanu Wiley Pedestrian Safety Project. And we also received this inquiry through um, Representative Takeno Uchi's office. And I believe I told Kelton, this is scheduled for the delineators to prevent that U-turn from HBA. Um, those installations are scheduled for this month. It is, um, they're, they are going to have temporary striping in the area until the permanent striping comes in sometime between November and December. So if there are any concerns about crookedness, that's because it's the temporary striping. After December, it'll be the permanent striping and that should be rectified. Um, and at any time there are any questions, please just interrupt me. Um, so we also got a question about our, road clo our roadway closures. So we update those every Friday afternoon um, and you can sign up for them um, on our on our website, the hidot.hawaii.gov. Um, we got we received some concerns about 
possible conflicts and closures between BKVK, Pali, and the H3. So for the H3 closures, those were, that was generally emergency work to rectify um, some joint repair. And that work, we will no longer need any full closures um, for the foreseeable future. Our Pali Highway um, improvements, the, 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 our project manager has assured me that we will be completed in December. Um, UK VK resurfacing, which has moved on to the Kaneohe side, um, should be completed sometime later this month. But we do have our engineers enter the closures for the week ahead um, to try to deconflict as much as possible. And then the last was the update on the red light camp safety camera project. So as Senator Rhodes had mentioned, so far what we we have 10 intersections. Some intersections have more than one approach that do have these safety cameras. Um, what we are seeing as the cameras mature is a decrease in the red light running violations. So that tends to trend between 40 to 60% reduction in red light running. Um, for the specific cameras we were asked about were the Ikilike and School Street. And currently those are not at the point where they've where they've been in, activated for citations for six months, but we are seeing, we were seeing about 40 citations a month when the cameras started up. And now I believe like as of the latest numbers I have, we've had about um, about 30. So hopefully as people get more used to them um, and the expectation that you do need to obey the law and stop at the red light, there will be a further reduction. So subject to any questions? Uh, do you wanna follow up on uh, item number 10.1 and 10.2? Uh, as a state, um, that wait, solved wait, can I the talk to, eradication of the no, parrot. Can I talk to it's a good question of DP? Oh, of yeah, go ahead. Transportation? Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Okay, so on the um, the school and leaky leaky school and leaky leaky turn, no one has talked about taking away that no right turn on red and really. The other day I was there, it took me six minutes to cross going Diamond Head side. Three light changes before I went from Gulick through the, through the Leaky Leaky. Okay, and while I was doing that, everybody was turning onto Leilani. And you said 200 cars on Leilani. Leilani is not even two lanes wide and it has cars parked on one side. So it really is a safety issue, and I really, go drive it, especially when there's kids going in and out of school, and you have a preschool on one corner, and on the other corner you have a elementary school. It's a very dangerous corner, and things are getting really bad. People are beginning to do really stupid things because waiting six and a half minutes to get across one traffic light is a little bit out of it. What do you recommend that we do? As a matter of fact, you know, it's interesting. I experienced the same thing. I, I, took, I took that to go across, uh, you know, rather than come up, I, I went down School Street and I think it was, yeah, right. It was three, three, uh, three, three lights. What's why? Why is it three lights? I mean, what's what's holding it up? In the past, pe people would take a right. Yeah. When it was a red light, but safe, yeah. and they would take a right onto onto Leaky Leaky. Yeah. And that brought down the number of cars. Now they all wait. No one can move, so they're all there waiting, and then it backs up, and then once they get across, there's people turning left into Ham Shopping Center. So that stops it. And as soon as it stops, then the light changes. So what do you recommend? The, the question. Go back to the drawing board. Put the, I'll allow right turns on red. Okay. Did so you hear the, that? Yes. And the, the reason why we implemented the no right turn on red was because of several serious crashes. 
So there were crashes. There was one in 2019 where a pedestrian was hit by a vehicle traveling eastbound turning right. Um, and then there was another in 2020 where um, a, basically a vehicle on School Street traveling eastbound turning right hit another vehicle traveling southbound. And another vehicle vehicle where a school, someone traveling School Street westbound turning right hit a vehicle traveling northbound. That was why we implemented the no right turn on red. Um, okay, so there are 30,000 cars that go through that intersection every single day. And you're saying in four years, there were three accidents. And so when, you, when the light turns green, so does the walk sign. So now they can't turn right because people are now walking where they could have gone when it was clear and it was a red light, but now they're waiting. And so nobody's going. So it's more likely that people are going to get hit because people are frustrated and just waited six minutes to get to that corner. So our okay. engineers are keeping an eye on the on the safety of that intersection. And they've indicated that since the implementation of the no right turn on red, there have not been any crashes. Um, they have gone out and done observations. I can ask them again that and tell them that the board again is is asking for that, but this is why we implemented it. Well, I, uh, so Carol, do you want them to revisit the issue and see if they come up with an alternative um, solution? Yes, please. Okay, did you hear that? Yes. Okay, so if you can come up with an alternative solution rather than us, us have to wait for. I disagree. Three. With wait, hold on. It's, you know. Three stoplights. Yes, Donald, you disagree. I disagree, uh, disagree with the right turn. We should have the um, stop at the red light because it's safety as far as I'm concerned. And I keep on adjusting. It is not leaky, leaky. It is Salee Street. If you go and look on the top where there is a green background with a white Larry, it says. Kali Street. And so, it also so, says no, 68, no, I, I mean, which is If you want to change that to leaky leaky, fine. But as far as I'm concerned, let's make this thing straight. It is Kali Street. On that street, leaky. it also has a 68 in a circle. And that 68 in a circle is leaky well, leaky. I, I, I guess we're going to change that. Uh, okay. Actually, okay. it's Route let me, 63. Let me, let me interrupt. Uh, as far as we, I'm concerned, look, the way, I, let me inter I want the red light because the thing is that. What's the problem is from say about 1.30 to three o'clock when camp school gets off, that's where the clutter is because they wanna make a left turn. To me, the left turn should be longer. So the people who wants to go to Wainai or whatever they, they wanna make the left turn to on Kali Street, they can get to the freeway because that's the problem, it's not. Okay, Don, you know, I'm gonna interrupt you. Is a difference of opinion, but actually, all that they wanted to do was to revisit the issue and see if there's an alternative. If there is no alternative, then so be it. There is no alternative, and to me, safety. I think all of us agree that safety is a prime concern. Henry, you had something to say. I think an alternative might be is widening and um, condemning some of the properties so they can make a. Um, I want to say a right turn lane along there or a kind of overpass onto the freeway anyway. But okay. that's a fat chance. Why but my question is that you, um, Shelly indicated that there were two factor um, points at some of these red, red light camera areas. I mean, could you explain that in further detail? Yes, so at some of the intersections, the system is only tracking one direction. So in the case of the Liki Liki and um, School Street intersection, um, we are actually doing two directions. So we are doing um, southbound Liki Liki and School Street and um, northwestbound School Street and Liki Liki. And any other locations that I need to be aware of? Those locations, I will put a link to um, our webpage with the map as well as the specific locations in the in the chat. 
I'm already okay. Yeah, right. no. Okay, thank you. Uh, item number 10.1 and 10.2, uh, it's been ongoing. Any have, Has the state come up with a solution for the eradication of parrots and feral chicken, or should I take that off, or are we just going to have to live with that for the rest of our lives? This is under uh, Senator Chair, Kim and, and Representative Tanauchi. Yeah, yes. Chair, so um, I can talk about that briefly again. We're, we're waiting for next legislative session, remember? So if you, I mean, you can take it off and I can just report whenever on it. I'm going to be introducing another bill um, on behalf of the board, or Thanks. if you want to leave it on, I'm happy, but there's not going to be any update till next legislative session on this issue. Well, it, it's see. funding. It's a funding issue at this point. It's a funding issue. Mm -hmm. So we're still going to have these little chickens and parrots flying around. Um, right. The chicken might be a joint city state thing, but at least for the rosewing parakeets. <laughs> well, should I leave it on? Anybody? Oh, do we oh, just wait for you? Um, um, on the Senate side, there was, um, yes. So, Senator Kim established or she introduced SCR 92, and it was established last le legislative session. And so it's a working group that is interdepartmental. That means city and county, Department of Agriculture, um, to council members, but the and more. But the goals of this working group are to research ways to capture the feral chickens and uh, basically figure out what to do. What are the options and what are the costs involved? The details of what this working group entails is listed in the SCR, which is a concurrent resolution by the house and the senate so there is movement there has been one meeting so far but there is um at least a lot of interdepartmental um, brainstorming during this interim so i'll leave it on the agenda okay it's, it hasn't been solved yet that's what you're telling us right yes is that right um it yes. hasn't been solved i'm still going to see little chickens running across the street Never mind, you don't have to answer that question. Yeah, well, 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 at next, least we're not um, as bad. The next Sorry, meeting I, council I, well, member. I mean, they got they really got inundated. Uh, the second question I have, um, item 10.2, uh, Red Hill update. Is there anything on that? Or we just we just wait for I mean, I know that the the military is moving too. Anything else that you have to report? Anything that we should uh, be of a concern? So should I leave it on the agenda? Unless something sparks. Well, um, the most recent update as of today is that um, Joint Task Force Red Hill is still on schedule to begin defueling in October, let's see, uh, October 16th. So that's according to schedule. And so, also, they do have an app uh, on Google Play and the iTunes Store. Just if you uh, type in um, like uh, Red Hill Fuel Tanks or Joint Task JTF. RH, uh, there will be an app that uh, provides my, the most my question use. is the senator going to up keep a, keep a, uh, updating us on the, the progress of the Red Hill. Uh, yeah, as so far as their updates provided by the joint task force, then, then, I'll, and, then I'll leave it on the agenda. Okay, I think we're all concerned sorry. about our water. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any from the public? Okay, moving right along. Thank you very much. Um. All right, uh, Representative Tanauchi, Jenna. Hi, Talking everybody. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for jumping in ahead Hi. of my turn. Um, just to really quickly recap, um, yes, I do still have both those items I know have been um, on my part of the agenda, both the homeless encampment and Liliokalani Botanical Garden that I, 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 I hear the frustration. I know I am also very frustrated that we haven't made much movement on it. Um, I mean, DOT tells me that they go down every few months and sweep their part. I know the city's part where it's on the embankment takes a little bit more equipment, a little more planning, um, but I will continue, of course, to follow up and see what we can do about the site as long as we need to. And again, as far as the Rose Ring parakeets are going, I'm happy to reintroduce a bill for funding for invasive species next year again to look at what we can do. Um, and again, feel free to leave it on the agenda, but yeah, probably no big updates until we can get them some funding to look at the issue. Um, 
I know we're kind of running a little late and you guys have presentations. So very quickly, um, thank you to everybody um, who came out to my town hall meeting the other week. Um, we had a good discussion with some of our house colleagues, um, Della Bellotti, who's the health and homelessness chair and Troy Hashimoto, the housing chair, um, as well as um, some of our leadership team, Speaker Psyche, Vice Speaker Iligan, and Majority Leader Napamura. Um, if you did miss it, we are compiling all the questions that both um, happened at the meeting and some of the questions we didn't get to. Um, and we'll I'll I'll share that with the board and we're sharing it with all the meeting participants and people on our list as well. If you just want to see what we talked about. Um, oh, uh, for request of vice chair, um, he and I are working on um, getting additional signage for the homeless encampment, a second homeless encampment in the New Uwanu stream. This is the, the street, New Uwanu stream bridge um, near Pa'oa and New Uwanu Avenue, where the gas station is. I know under that bridge has been ongoing illegal activity, chop shop, drugs, what have you um, at that site. So um, DLNR did give me an update um, the other week when I sat down with them to talk about a lot of the homeless on their property, that they do have an active, um, request in. I think they're just waiting maybe for the next batch of signs to get in, but I did ask them to keep me updated if they have any more concrete timeline when they can get enforcement, uh, not enforcement, installation out there. Um, so that is um, something on their radar, um, actively being pursued to help HPD and other um, law enforcement with kind of getting people out of there, giving them a little bit more teeth, hopefully, when um, they go to site and try to get those guys out of that area. Um, the last kind of thing, we got some information about the Hawaii Healthcare Education Loan Repayment Program. This is um, the new program that we kind of create, we created by this, in this at the state to help with the healthcare worker shortage that we're seeing in Hawaii. So this program has $30 million for education loan debt repayment to medical professional, for, to our medical professionals who um, provide care to patients in Hawaii um, for at least for two years, full-time or half-time, and then they can um, get um, starting, they can get loan repayments starting at $12,500 and capped at $50,000. I'll put a copy of the link if you know anyone in these fields who might apply or might be able to apply and take advantage of this. Um, it's one of the things um, the legislature really looked at to kind of, you know, bring or retain um, professionals here in the islands to help with the healthcare worker shortage. And if there's anything else, happy to take any questions. Oh, no, thank you very much. Any questions from the board? Any from the audience? If not, thank you, Representative. Okay. Hope we thank can get that video Kalani solved and also the feral chickens, thanks. I, I know, I, I, <laughs> I've been on the botanical garden site for, for many years. <laughs> I, I, I hear you, Chair, don't, don't worry. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> that area, if you haven't been down to the Lili Okalani Gardens, I, I, I grew up down there and it's really changed. It's very beautiful. But again, you know, when you got homeless floating all over the place. Uh, so if you get a chance, you know, you can just go down there and have a picnic. Maybe share your food with the homeless. I know, not true. Anyway, uh, Representative John Mizuno. Re Representative Daniel Holt. How about our governor's representative, Dallas? Um, how about a representative from our congressional district, Representative Ed Case? It's not. <laughs> okay, what we've been waiting for. Your water bill is going to go up. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to have a presentation by the Board of Water Supply. I just got educated that, by the way, I thought we only had one water system, but the answer is no, we got more. If you're not happy with BWS, go to your own well. No, it's joking. <laughs> but anyway, Board of Water Supply, <laughs> you're up. Um, my name is Henderson Uhiva. I'm the Program Administrator for Information Technology at the Board of Water Supply. I'm a little taller, so I'm adjusting. With me tonight, uh, there's a number of people that are from the board that could help any question, answer any questions that come up. 
um, Kathleen Elia-Pahinui, our communications officer, Erwin Kuata, our deputy manager, Will Cooper from, um, from finance. He's our waterworks controller. So he's the man with money. And of course, Keone is helping out out of Kathleen's office. Um, understanding that we're on a quick tight schedule here, I decided to forego the uh, PowerPoint or death by PowerPoint, so some 30, 40 slides, and we'll do it pretty simply. Board of Water Supply, some of you may or may not know, is a semi-autonomous agency with the city. What that means is there's two important differentiators. One is funding and the other is governance. From a funding perspective, we are self-funded. We get no money from the city, so anything that you pay to city coffers do not come our way. It's only what we can collect in the form of our rates or fees. Secondly, uh, we are governed by a board of directors. Um, so anything that we want to do relative to funding and budgets have to be approved by the board. And that brings me to why I'm here tonight. We're basically looking at new rates to go into effect, um, hopefully January or February of next year if the board approves. And it'll be a rate schedule that would be about five and a half years. It will take us out through July of 2028 would be the last rate change. Um, as Chair Fong mentioned, the proposed rates is an increase. And part of what we're doing, and um, we've been doing for about the last two months, have been going out to the community to get community feedback. And the feedback from the community will be passed on to the board for consideration along with the proposal that we have in place. Uh, we've been, I think we've done four community outreach sessions across the island and have been at a number of uh, neighborhood boards already with others scheduled through October to provide this information. One of the things that you may want to consider is what are the rates for? And for us, the rates is basically for the operation of the board. Um, there's a number of things that we are dealing with and have been dealing with for the past few years. Um, Red Hill, everybody knows about that one. And we've had to change our operations relative to the crisis that Red Hill caused. We shut down one of our major sources of water. So what we need to look at then is how do we get that source replaced? And a lot of our funding for the next period that this rate schedule is covering is allocated towards that, looking at new sources of water. Um, we're also looking at the impact of inflation that's occurred on all of us. And in our case, it's been pretty steep when it came to power. Um, the board is a large user of HECO electricity. So we've taken the hit by quite a bit. Uh, 33 million was our cost for electricity last year, about 20% more than we had budgeted. So from the board's operational perspective, we tried to keep a flat as possible budget to make sure everything balances out, given these kinds of changes that have occurred. Looking down the road, we have other things that we need to be concerned about. Um, PFAS, P4, or the forever chemical issues that you may have heard about, as well as the um, EPA-led copper ruling that is gonna require our involvement to address lead uh, lines, which thankfully we don't have a lot of, if at all. But that still is a concern that we need to look forward to. Along these lines is the ongoing maintenance and operations. What does that mean? Well, you all know about our main breaks and our water plan, 30 year water plan that we have put in place um, is gonna be updated given some of these changes that have occurred because when we created that 30 year water plan for the replacement of pipelines, Red Hill wasn't an issue. A lot of these other things were not issues that we had to deal with. So we're gonna go back and revisit that plan. But that plan had basically looked at replacing 21 miles of pipe every year. With the need to find new source, it changes how we have to look at our spending and changes what we can or cannot do. But that has the, the, the reason or answers the question of why are we looking at increasing rates? Um, I would actually direct you folks to this handout. It gives a good review of how the rate change can be imp impacting you. Also online on our website, um, Honolulu, not Honolulu, but boardofwatersupply.com is complete information on the rate change that we're proposing. I'll make it cut and dry so we don't go into a lot of time and also to leave time for questions. What does it mean in terms of the costs? What are we looking at doing? We're looking at a rate change of an increase over that five and a half uh, years 
First, if we are able to get it approved through our board, 10% in the January, February timeframe, followed by another 10% in July. And from that point forward, changes every July. And the changes will be 9%, 8.5%, 8, and 8%. Cumulative, it's about a 66.9% increase. However, it doesn't mean that your individual bills will go up that amount. And that's why it gets to be a little complicated. There's a lot of details that is the death by PowerPoint of 30 to 40 slides. But because of the classes that we deal with, whether or not you're single family residential, multifamily residential, non-residential, agriculture, there's all different rates for that and different tiers within those classifications for some of them, which is charging you for delivery of the water based upon how much water you consume. What we've done is try and minimize, and this has been an ongoing philosophy, try and minimize the fixed charge to our customers and put as much as we can into the hands of the customers by tying it to usage. Very different from our sister organization, which is also on the water bill, but be clear it's not us, that's ENV on the city side, and they're charging you for sewer on our bill. Um, but if you looked at your bill closely, you'll see that their fixed cost is very high. Their ongoing monthly base. We take that different approach and try and put as much back into the consumer's hands as possible. Additionally, we promote a lot of water conservation to try and help reduce what your usage is. But that's the bottom line when you look at it. Um, again, I don't want to take a lot of time. I think it was only allotted five minutes. I might have gone a little bit over that. But more than willing to take questions. And like I said, we have people here that can help answer them if you throw a hardball at me that I can't answer. Uh, thank you very much. Before we had this, you know, we're reading outside, I was a uh, I was very, um, I would just say, surprised. There are more water sources in the Board of Water Supply, which I thought was the only game in town. Maybe you could share with us. It's not everybody uses the Board of Water Supply water. And the second question I have is, it's been an ongoing question. Why is sewer, you know, coupled with water? Uh, is this common in the United States? So for the first question, <clears throat> there are multiple um, water systems on island, and I think as we mentioned to you outside, um, one notable one is if you go to Kaluru, uh up in Laie, that's a private water system. Uh, we don't provide the water there. But there are a number of, of situations like that. Uh, all the military bases except Kaneohe, we do not provide the water for them. Um, effectively, and a lot of people don't know this, but we like to say the water is actually free. We're not charging you for the water. We're charging you to deliver the water to your house so that it comes out of your tap. Um, with regards to the sewer bill, there's some history behind that. Um, back, I think, I don't know, Erwin, if you know, but I think it was like in the 70s, there was a move, I think it was under Harris, Mayor Harris, to combine ENV or what, you know, the sewer side with water and put it in one agency. Um, that's kind of started the move to a joint bill. Um, that didn't actually complete, remained separate, but the billing did. So we've been still billing for them on our bill. I'll, I'll say something that I think my boss, Ernie, will tell you. We are more than happy to take the sewer bill off of our bill and let sewer charge their own. But unfortunately, that hasn't been happening yet. Thank you. Questions from the board? Yes, uh, Henry. Um, because right now we're looking for alternate water sources caused by the feds, our military anyway, are we able to get some reimbursement from them or funding or fines to help offset some of these um, searching of other water sources? That's an ongoing question and issue. It always comes up. Um, from the board's perspective, we haven't let that go. We are going to pursue as much as we can. 
But you understand or uh, think about source development. It's something that has to be done now if we want to bring the source online five to seven years from now, because that's how long it's going to take to develop production wells. So we can't wait for the feds to give us the money to do that. We got to go do it now. But it doesn't mean we're not going to stop trying to pursue the funds to get reimbursed back from the feds. We'll still do that. Look at doing that. Any other questions? Board, how about the audience? Any questions? Okay. Oh, I have one last one being Chinese. Is there a cheaper way to get my water rather than the border water supply? So, <laughs> um, Chair Fong, I am half Pake. So I guess half of me would go next door when the neighbors aren't home. But. <laughs> You answer my question. Yes, chance. I understand the reason for the rate increases, but I'm just curious after that we do find alternative sources, um, is it possible that the rates will go back down? Or not to what they are now, of course, but you know, they'll, they'll lower from what from what the expected increase is supposed to hit. The way the rate structure occurs, it's basically um, covering cost of service. So it would really depend on what our costs are when you look out past the current rate proposed rate structure. So it'd be as you probably around the 2027, 20, 20 time frame, we'll be looking at the next rate schedule and there'll be a projection at that point in time done as to what the cost would be and what would need to be covered. So that's really the factor. Is the cost gonna go down in our operations? If it is, then the rate structures will reflect that accordingly. Any other questions? Yeah, I got them. Yeah, Donald. Your budget. Are you folks? I believe you folks are independent from the city and county budget. Semi autonomous, yes. We have our own budget. And then all the money you collect that, uh, um, in other words, you folks are not transparent. I would like to see a model in a paper that what was your expense and how much you made and if you had any surplus. And if, if that's the case, I wanna know how many years you have all this surplus. Because if you look, you're one of the so-called city and county um, facility that you always have brand new trucks. <laughs> and you folks laugh, but that's true. If you guys look at it, you all have brand new trucks. I mean, the city has all these broken down trucks, but you guys come up with brand new trucks, brand new facility, brand new equipment. So the question is, are you folks transparent? Do you folks tell the public how much you spent and how much surplus you get? And the question is, does the surplus, now where does that surplus go? Because if you want to raise the rate, because I pay a flat rate. Okay, I don't exceed, but I don't know how much I can exceed to get to, get to the flat rate. Because you folks don't tell us. You just tell us, well, this is, it. this is your flat rate, and that's it. The question I have is that I save water from my roof, but yet, you know, I still have a flat rate. So if you can tell me, how much water that you can use to reach that flat rate, I would appreciate it. And I think a lot of our neighbors would appreciate it because something is not clear to me because I know you folks making money. Okay? You cannot tell me not. I know you folks are making money, but yet you guys are asking for increases. And the other one was about the new dams you folks added. First of all, the, the uh, Nuwano Dam, you folks, a reservoir, I should say, you go when bring it down the level. Because Brandon wanted the so called, what Brandon, what type of fish was that? Catfish. 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 Okay. So the question now, now you folks come, coming back and telling us, oh, now we want to raise the level again. I mean, you wasted all this water because you send it down 
down to the ocean, and all of a sudden you say, oh, we need to save water. Oh, but yet we have to increase your rate. I mean, it doesn't really make sense to me because why do you throw away water and now you're asking us to pay more for the water? Thank you. No, no, no problem. The first item with regards to transparency, you can go on our website and we have everything posted there. Um, you can actually see our budgets. Our budgets are vetted with our board in public session. So all of that information is there as well. More importantly, I think if you're looking at the residential rates and you're wondering what your rate structure is, the key quantities to look at is 2,000, 6,000 gallons. And that's where most people will fall. Um, 2,000 is the lowest rate possible. And actually that rate, we call it our essential tier, is provided lower than the cost to actually deliver the water. That's kind of the rate that we put in place to for people that are on fixed incomes that are tough, if they can control their, their um, costs or their consumption down to that 2,000 gallons a month, they're actually getting water for less than it costs us to deliver it to them. Yeah. Um, that's the second part of your question. That's it. No, the, 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 the second question was, you post lower the reservoir. Oh, the reservoir. And now you guys tell me that you want to increase it again. And, the, the, and, and it doesn't really make sense. You threw away all this water, but now you want you know, to fill yep. it up again. And now. I mean, so, so New Wano Reservoir 1, Reservoir 4 um, are basically our responsibilities as dams. They're open reservoirs that we don't actually utilize for our water system. Um, that came from the state. They didn't want to take it back. They left it with us. So what we're looking at with this project that Senator Rose talked about is basically to look at utilizing that water to recharge the aquifer. Um, that way we can get it into a form that we can use in our system. At the same time, utilizing the difference in elevation to generate electricity to help offset some of the costs. Um, it's hydro generation, basically, is what they call it. So that requires that you have a certain amount of water in Nu'uanu 4, which is at a higher elevation than where Nu'uanu 1 is, and run the water down using the gravity to, through the turbine to generate the electricity, and then taking the water at Nu'uanu 1 and injecting it back into the ground where it'll filter through back into the aquifer. So it's a little different scenario. That was something that um, I think we started looking at a few years ago. Yeah. So where is this? So-called dam is going to be built because no, no, the dam is there. That dam is already there. Yeah, because yeah. the thing is that uh, a couple of years back, remember when we had the heavy rain, this big thing about the fire department had to come and pump the water down the yeah. stream and all that, and they were worried that by pumping down the water, the residents below that would be all flooded out and all that. So the question I have is that how secure is your dam? And that's something that we manage, um, especially with the heavy rains and overflow scenarios. So we put in place a number of um, siphon and pumps situations, especially on New One and One, because that was the one that was a concern. And so we keep the level lower when it rains heavy to try and make sure that with heavy rains, we don't run into a potential overflow or a flooding scenario. Yeah. Yeah, but when you do that, the so-called collecting of the water if you go to a lower level, you get less water to uh, go down to the different reservoirs. That one is the one that's down below. Okay. Yeah. The one at the top doesn't have an issue with their overflow. But isn't the one on the top goes down to the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is that if you have a problem on the top. Donald, I want to interrupt. Can we move on? All right. Thanks. <laughs> yes, Henry. How close to fruition is this um, hydroelectric generator and design and are there funding and all the other questions involved? Could you, could you repeat the question? Okay. How close are we to actually having this as a reality? Let's put it down. So this is what I would look at as more of a pilot project at this point to test the concept. Um, how much can we utilize it? It's going to depend on a number of factors, one of which is what can we actually expect relative to production off of that location? Because there's not many locations we have. I shouldn't say there's 
I don't think there's any other locations we have where we can do this with. That's kind of unique in that way. But I think, yeah, I think. Uh, sir, uh, we're still in the middle of doing dam safety repairs at New Wanu 4, and then we're going to be starting on New Wanu 1. So it is a pilot project. It is down the road. I don't have a time frame for you, but we can come back and uh, we can ask Barry Usagawa, our water resources guy, when he thinks that might get started. So we can let you know. But it's not imminent. Five years? Maybe. Yeah, that sounds more likely. <laughs> could, could we also... Hope that uh, you know, allow catfish. Um, we know that that we we know that that's something the community really wants, and we're actually working with council member, and we work with representative and senator as well. We're aware of the community's desire for that. We we will definitely take that under concern. Really quickly, chair, any information you want on our financials, please go to boardofwatersupply.com. Go to the about section to our board of directors. Actually, Joe Cooper does quarterly reports to our board of directors. We do a financial audit every year that's posted on our website. So all of our financial information is there. And one of the slides in the deck that we gave you actually shows you where all the money goes. It's a broken down pie chart showing you where the expenses are. So thank you very much for your time tonight. No, thank you. You can keep us posted with uh, the Board of Wires Files gives us a report. Actually, I want to thank uh, the Board of Water Supply for what, especially what you're doing in regards to the, the Red Hill project. I mean, I'm military, but, you know, to me, water is so valuable, even though our military is very important. I guess the bottom line of this whole thing means that uh, I got to take less showers and make them shorter. That's it, right? Is that it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, whatever. Uh, um, oh, the catfish thing. It was actually an esoteric. Many, it really started many, many years ago because the gentleman on my right, left rather, promised to give us a, a catfish, uh, what do you call it? At least five years ago. Free fish fry. So we were still waiting. Yeah. But thank you very much. Any other questions from the board? How about from the audience? If not, thank you very much. Uh, the next slide of 8.2-1801, Lanakila Avenue, Transitional Youth. Someone's, oh, here we go. Yeah, please take the, uh, the mic and tell us all about your project. Hi, my name is Alicia. I'm here. Hi, my name is Alicia, and I'm here representing RISE. Uh, so RISE is a nonprofit organization here on Oahu, and we work with youth who are experiencing homelessness, um, youth for ages between ages of 18 to 24 years. And so I'm here today to tell you all about a new project that we are bringing to the community here um, at 1801 Lanakila Avenue. So this is a clean and sober home for youth who are experiencing homelessness, um, and it is uh, wraparound services, so we provide um, Certified substance abuse counselors, treatment plans, um, case managers, behavioral health, um, all the services to help with um, youth who are um, in recovery from um, substance use. So we are currently uh, open last month. Um, we have six residents who are there right now. Um, and we are excited to be here in the community. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you all have. Yes, thank you very much. Information. This is strictly for information for the board. But you do, you don't need any approval. Uh, it's already in operation anyway. But thank you for coming. Any questions from the board? Yes. Yes. Where where is your facilities located? If it's in our neighborhood or not? Yes. So it's um. So our main uh, shelter is in Kailua, but we have our house that is in um, Kalihi area. It's eighteen oh one Lanakila Avenue. And so that's where the um, clean and sober home is. Any other questions? Yes, Chance. I know you mentioned that you have substance abuse counselors you guys work with. Um, I was just curious as to what the word might be partners um, you guys are currently working with. Uh, some partners that we work with. Um, so we work with um, a lot of different nonprofit organizations in the community. So like Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction, um, food banks, so we get um, regular food bank drop-offs, and then we do regular food bank runs to um, bring food to the home to provide that. Um, just 
a lot of different um, organizations that we partner with um, in one way or another. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I just recently watched the movie Sounds of Freedom, and it was very moving. I mean, how, out of curiosity, what kind of percentage, I mean, is it true anyway? And what kind of percentage of the kids you guys deal with anyway are affected by child trafficking and whatnot? And um, I don't have specific um, statistics on that, but that is um, a adverse childhood experience. So um, youth who um, experience adverse childhood experiences. Average? I'm sorry? You said average? Adverse. Adverse. Uh, they are more likely to experience homelessness and substance um, abuse. So we do have um, a high amount of youth who um, have um, experience with that. Thank but you. I don't have the specific statistics on it. Any other questions from the board? How about the audience? Well, I want to thank you for coming down and sharing, you know, the good work that you're doing and welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. We are very excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, we're moving right along. Approval of minutes for August 14th. I need a motion to approve any correction for any corrections to begin with for the August 14th minutes. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of August 14th, 2023. I move. Move by Brandon, seconded by Dale. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Opposition, motions carried. Minutes approved. Uh, under unfinished business, I think we pretty much, oh, <laughs> item number 10.4, 10.6, and 10.7 all at one time. Our representatives from DPP, and I want to thank them again for showing up with uh, some good news. Thank you, Chair Fong. Jiro Sumata, Deputy Director for the Department of Planning and Permitting. Uh, just a general update for Monster Homes. Uh, last month, uh, I up said that we revoked 13 permits and had one pending. So since then, we uh, resolved one, but then we added a new one. So we're still back at 13, 13 revoked permits from Monster Homes. Uh, as far as 2037 Liliha, the NOV, the notice of violation was issued on January 8th, 2023. It was referred to the notice of order. That's where they, the, they issue a fine and, they, and there's a daily fine that starts tracking that was sent on February 27th. Uh, there is no stop work order in effect right now for 2037 Lili. Huh? The correction uh, permit is application is under review, but they still have one revoked permit. On 1532 Hanai Loop, the, the notice of violation was issued on April 18th this year, referred to notice of order on June 13th. There is a stop work. Uh, order in effect for that property. We did investigations on May 22nd, June 13th, and August 15th, and there's no construction activity ongoing. Uh, the permit is actually the permit res revocation is at the Building Board of Appeals, so uh, that's still in process and it still has to be scheduled. So I think that's probably going to be in 2024 before they ever get a chance to try to resolve that. Our favorite property, 1162 Hala oh. Drive. So 1162 Hala Drive, Chair, is, a, as you had mentioned, it, it is a permitted home with potentially a use violation of five or more un unrelated people. Uh, we met, had a meeting with the uh, Corporation Council, and we are refining the process by which we're going to start interviewing witnesses and what I'd like to ask the board and any community members is that if you know of someone that wants to testify to help us get a court ordered warrant uh, that was the problem you know when we went to their house repeatedly uh, uh, they, if they refuse us access our inspectors 
then we can't do anything. So uh, we can only observe from the outside. But if we can gather enough witness testimony or affidavits and submit that to the court, then hopefully we can uh, entice a judge to issue a, a warrant that would allow us to go on their property and conduct a, a formal investigation. Uh, so, but we need to gather the evidence basically. So if any of the board or the community has names of people that you want to, for us to interview with the corporation council and our inspectors, just if you can route it to Brandon Mitsuda, he'll collate all the names and the contact information like phone number and email address. And then we'll schedule uh, the interviews uh, probably late this month and uh, mid to late in October. And then when we gather all that, you know, we'll, then we'll try to make our move to the courts. Carol? Should I, uh, will, will the witnesses remain anonymous or will they be? I don't know exactly how Corporation Council wants to handle it, but they're going to kind of lead, a, a, they're going to lead the questioning and also gathering of the information. Yeah, because, uh, so I cannot. I, I cannot answer that one. Yeah, because if if your neighbors, you don't want them to know you were the witness against them. Because, yeah. Well, we still would, would encourage them to come talk to us, you know. And and at that interview, the question of uh, being anonymous can be addressed at that time. I want to thank you, you know, for doing something. I still remember appearing on TV, and I'm saying, twenty-eight toilets. You know, I, I was correct that there's only 23. <laughs> so, you know, and nothing's happened. So now you are doing something. And I remember it saying, go to the court council. Then I don't get the you know, legal bite into it, as they say. And, but I say good luck. But that's been a real sore thumb for us a long time. Yeah, we're kind of looking at it as like a, a test case, so to speak, because if we can refine this process, it can actually help us uh, become more efficient about use violations. Uh, and uh, anyway, Corporation Council is really helping us. Well, that's that's good to hear because actually, you know, I look at it with, with the Corp Council, you know, it, the owner is flaunting the law. Right. He's flaunting it. I mean, when you, I, what, I, what did I understand? You went to his address and he wasn't, at his former address not there. And he oh, yeah, we, we all we, could find him anyway. Right. Mm. They, they play a game. They know how to play the, the games. Game. Yeah. Somebody had a. Henry. Um, on your court order, you may want to request a DNA sampling of each individual because they lie through their teeth. Oh, that's my cousin. You know I me. Mean? I'm related. I've seen that time and time again. Hard to identify. They're non related. And also, that 2037 Liliha Street, you said there was a no stop work order? Correct. That's what our staff said. So they can continue working, but they still have a revoke permit they need to resolve. Okay. If, what is a revoke permit? Then basically, we cancel their permit. So they cannot build whatever was authorized to be built. And, and it kind of gets to that other talk that uh, um, Brandon was talking about, the bill about false statements. The false statements uh, uh, effort is not just for making false statements to our inspectors. It's also making false statements when you make a building permit application. So in the construction plans, if you show the floor area ratio or the, uh, for the number of bedrooms or where the bound, boundary line is or where your house is being built, um, all that information needs to be true and honest in what they reflect as to what our plan reviewers are reviewing the code for. So it's not just for uh, inspectors that they need to be honest and truthful when they submit a set of plans to us for plan review to issue the permit that documents those documents need to be accurate because we've been finding out that they they put all kind of false information on the plans our guys you know they're not going out to the site during the plan review to check everything but they'll issue will issue the permit based on what that uh, application says and what their engineer or architect has certified to us Okay, but can you ding the architect, yes. the draftsperson, yeah. the engineer that stamped it? Yes. I mean, all of that. Have so, you guys or are you guys going to ding them? Um, we, we've actually 
for the monster homes, the 13 that we uh, revoked the permits, there's two that we've uh, kind of noticed a pattern because they're, they, they've been involved in multiple monster homes. So we have suspended, uh, the, this is the third party reviewers. We've suspended their license with uh, our, their ability to do third party review uh, for us. So, and we stopped them on all their permits, not just the monster home. If they've done third party review, they we suspended their operation for uh, everything that they've applied for. So they're feeling that that hurt. I can tell you that much. They've called the director's office several times. Okay. So, but what happens? Like that one didn't have a stop work order. Twenty thirty seven. Well, need to resolve the permit now. Whether that's chop off part of your building or remove the number of toilets or you got to re revise your plans to make it legal. So you still need to comply with the, the requirements. I mean, you guys got, from the construction process, site work guys, right, that do, do the inspection, right? Yes. And the electric, the electricians, right? And the plumbing guys, right? You guys, those are all your inspectors, right? That's correct. Nobody looks? They review the plans that were approved by the plan re our plan review staff. So they're checking according to what's approved on the plan. If, they, if the architect or engineer gives us false documents to get their plan approved, that's how they kind of hoodwink or trick our, our inspectors as they follow, try to follow what's approved. So it starts, actually starts with what is submitted for a permit application, the architect and engineers. So that's why we're hoping that the, uh, the, that bill that's going before council will go after them too. It's not just the homeowner. I mean, I don't remember if residentials have occupancy permits. I mean, you guys can deny them right there and then there, right? Well, that's why if they falsify what they draw for us, how, you know. So they don't get occupancy then, right? Well, if we, if we revoke their permit, they're not gonna even get to continue building. But 2037, if I'm not mistaken, they are continuing, right? They are continuing, but they have one revoked. There's two, per permit, two permits on that property. One of them have been, has been revoked. So now if they want to get it reinstated or to fix it, they need to reapply. And that's what's, what they're going through that process now. Okay, but I, I see that as a duplex unit, if I'm not mistaken, right? They have, a, I think it's a one large home and then they have a ADU, they have a separate uh, permit for a alternative dwelling unit. Okay. All right. No. I mean, I remember the last month's meeting, you indicated the public should, if they see work on, on activity on a project that has stopped work, to notify your department. Is there a standard procedure that the public should notify because I actually called because I was an person that that 2037 it had a stop work. I left a voicemail. I also pressed zero to get one attendant, hopefully, but there was a voicemail also left my name and number and whatnot, and nobody calls me back. I mean, you just turn the public off. You know what I mean? Why, am we, why are we going to waste our time already spinning our wheels? I mean, you ask the public to help you guys, right, and report these. But if you guys don't respond, how does that the public feel? You know what I mean? I'll check on our voice machine. That was three weeks ago. Yeah. Don, you had a question? Yes. You know, on the um, Hanai Loop uh, project, Yes. Uh, you're telling me that it is uh, um, a stop work order? Yes. The question I have is, um, can you guys not just pull the permit? Because if they do any work, technically you can abolish that uh, portion they, they did work because they would have no permit to do the work rather than a stop work. To me, a stop work is just, you know, like I said, I've seen guys working on that project. I told you folks about it. I asked you guys if you folks take a picture um, when you do the stop work, and 
when I ask you to go look at it, you push and compare the pictures. The question I have is that to me, the stop work is meaningless because they can still keep the work. I mean, whatever they did, they can still have it. But if you pull the permit and you found out that they, they, they did work, you can have that thing removed because there were no permit to, for, for the work to be done. So right now, that on, on 1532 Hanai Loop, yes. what's, what was built was the foundation only. They went out three times. I'll give you the dates. Are we talking about same? Because the one I'm talking about, there is a roof, a permanent roof on that. I mean, you're talking about a foundation. I mean, you know, uh, we are above that. Okay, well, maybe we're talking about a different thing. 1532 is the number they, my guys went to okay. report on. And you have a different and one? There was a project being built over there? Yes. Okay. And then the question I have is, do we, um, to me, this work means nothing. Because the guy can do it, you can you can charge him or penalize him, but he still keeps it. Now, if you pull the permit and he does work, that's unauthorized work. And I think you guys can have that demolished because there was no permit for the work. No, if he if we he we revoke his permit, he needs to reapply to continue. To whatever he wants to build but when we when he submits his application we're going to be looking at his plans with a pretty fine tooth comb now if he, he for, previously was falsifying what he submitted to us well the thing is that i'm not talking about plans i'm talking about actual building on the building putting up a roof or putting up walls i mean you told me the last time that you, when we bring it up, you both take a picture. Yes. And this was brought up by the city council and uh, our representative to okay. about this building. Let me read you the whole thing that you, they wrote. Photograph was taken on 816, matches the photo previously on dates 522 and 613 for previous requests for investigation. Uh, stop work or order followed. Photographs are scanned into docs have on notice of violation for the notice of violation NOV 04110. The violation has not been corrected as of 9 11 23. Permit revocation appeal received on April 24th, 2023. The Building Board of Appeals. So if we ask the council person and the state representative to verify what they saw when they Impose this problem or brought up the problem? Well, Don, Donald, if you don't believe what I'm reporting to you and you want council, the council member's office to come check out our files, no. they're more than welcome to come check. No, no. They were the ones who identified the problem. They were the ones for your so called plan, was not. That's why they had to stop work. And after that, I told you that the roof went up. I mean, uh, maybe we're talking about a different property, well, but it's Hanai Loop. Because the, the, the question I have is, that, you know, I don't want to see a stop work. I want you guys to pull the permit because the building permit, because if you pull the permit, if they do anything. That's correct. They, you, we pulled the permit. Over here, you said it's you, revoked. Put, uh, you work on the permit you didn't pull the permit you put a stop work that what you just told us we okay they issue a notice of violation and a stop work order right that's one thing right we revoked the permit that means we pulled it right okay. so they cannot do anything now all right all right well well when you just said the beginning you just put a stop work i mean that, that's what i got you didn't tell me about well you invoked the permit and all that i Okay, Don, I think he's clarified that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other questions from any other board members? You know, actually, Jerry, I want to thank you for being, you know, uh, really proactive so that with DPP now, because uh, we haven't had this kind of proactivity from before. So, and uh, we appreciate you coming down and giving us a status on at least the three real headaches, if nothing else. 
I think the bottom line is we just have to live with what was already built. But now in regards to use, we just got to crack down if nothing else. Yeah. So uh, I really want to, I think we really want to thank you know, DPP for being proactive, doing something. You're welcome, Chair. Yeah. Chair, you had a, uh, on a previous request about 12, 11, 11 drive, I think that family. Um, so I did remember receiving uh, a riser or a request last week. So we routed it through our staff. They'll check it out and then we'll kind of research what the status is and what we can or cannot do. Well, I think that's really great. Yeah. So we work with them. That's terrific. So we'll get your, your sewer problem taken care of, right? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions okay. from the audience? Thank None? you for thank, thank you. Thank you for coming anyway. Yes. But okay, moving right along. Thanks use, a lot. Uh, when we will we'll see next six months. Hey, Wes, I had a question. Henry? The use violation of use, I guess, anyway. Can you elaborate us on that portion of it? So for 1162 Hala Drive, the the allegation is that they are running a boarding house. They have over five uh, unrelated people living in there, but it's in a residential sub, uh, district. So the use violation is they're violating the zoning laws that we have in place, and we have to catch them in the act. It cannot just be the neighbors said, Oh, no, they got 12 different unrelated people living there or more. It's we have to actually do an inspection, go into the facility, uh, identify the people and or evidence that there are over more than five people, unrelated people living there. Uh, there's a variety of ways to do it. I'm not the expert in how our guys do it, but the main thing is we just want to get access to the unit so that we can do the inspection properly and then properly document that they are violating the law. Um, we also have limitations on even getting in. If they, we knock on the gate, we say we're with the city and county of Honolulu, we're here to inspect uh, for an use violation, they can refuse us access and we can do nothing. That's the laws that the operations uh, that we have to operate by. So. Uh, the solutions that we've tried before is, is, you know, we can monitor from the outside, like we used to track how many cars and try to figure out, okay, the different license plate, then we go check the uh, DMV and, okay, who are the registered owners? And, and there's excuses you can make around that. You know, like it, it's, these three cars, they're just visitors. They're our guests, right? They don't live here. So there's, there's different kind of ways that they can make excuses. But, but in any case, the main thing is that if we cannot gain access, then all we're doing is you know, wasting our time putting uh, door hangers on the gate or you know, trying to look from the outside and try to figure out exactly what's going on. But they're kind of, I think they're, they're on to us or they know that they're being checked because I guess the last time when I talked to Brandon, he kind of said that the activity has been kind of lessened. Or maybe it was with uh, Carol and a chance. They kind of indicated that maybe, I don't know whether it's the summer school session too, that might be, you know, it's like whether they're HPU students or not, but you know, who knows. But we gotta make sure that when we do get that warrant to be able to enter the property, that we catch them at the right time, you know. Yeah, let me just add on, the, the, the only way you're going to get into the private property and it is a violation, you're going to have to have a search warrant, but you need probable cause. Probable cause is based upon witness statements yeah. that you can go to the court and the court will grant you a search warrant. So you don't have to have permission to just go in, you know, call a SWAT team and we'll get them right anyway. But anyway, thank you. I hope that answers your question. Uh, One more, Henry. So what the public needs to be looking for is five people more per unit per house that, per well house has the adu also right so probably 10 people altogether type of situation and see i'm i'm ignorant to this this part of it anyway and 
what should we be looking for to well, help I, you guys? I think the, the main thing to me, having dealt with this in different districts or areas, neighborhoods, is is it causing a problem for your community? Right, and and it comes, it shows up in a lot of different ways. But one of the big ones is, there there have too many cars parked on the road, and that, you know, it whether it's taking up all the on street parking or or whether they're uh, having loud parties is another one, you know, and uh, excess amount of trash. So if if they're not being a nuisance to you folks, the neighbors then you know, I think they're maybe they're trying to get along, right? But it, when they start causing inconvenience or annoyances and, and disruption to what, su what should be a usually quiet neighborhood, I mean, that's why the, the subdivisions were, were designed and built like that, to restrict it to single family homes only, right? And then, you know, there's other parts of the community that have uh, appropriate zone for apartments. You know, so that's where they should be building these larger uh, multi-dwelling units that can accommodate 10, 15, 20 people or families, you know. But they are choosing to push the limit and they got their home built legally, but it, they still need to follow the laws of the city as far as not having more than five unrelated people. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe, and you'll keep us posted. One day, Chair, I'm going to get to a point where I can just give a written report to Edward, and he can report for me. Oh no, no, we we, appre <laughs> we appreciate your attendance and your thank proactivity. You, uh, you know, we're, we're getting where somewhere. I okay. appreciate that. Yeah. So You're thank welcome. you again. We'll see you next uh, month, same place. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Thank you. Now, on a brother note, the Liha Palama Christmas Parade. Thank you, Vern, for waiting this long. <laughs> hey, good evening. My name is uh, Vernon Nakamura. I'm part of the Liliha Palma Business Association, which consists of two members. Um, <laughs> I'm here because part of the permitting process for the city is to notify the community of number one, uh, intent of having a parade and number two, to obtain feedback. Uh, unlike our, our community, this really pertains to Waikiki where everybody wants to have a parade every week. So the city put this uh, requirement in to limit permits. But anyway, I mean parades. But anyway, I'm here tonight to ask for feedback, well, to notify the community that there's going to be a parade on November 24th, as usual, for the past 40 years, we had this, over 40 years, we had this parade. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving from 5.30 and usually runs till about 6.37. So Brandon, please put it in the minutes because I have to submit the minutes to, uh, to Daniel Reitman, Transportation Technology Division. And Daniel has been really nice. He's a really good guy working for the city. So I really enjoy working with him. So. Um, it would be helpful if the board endorses the parade as they have done in all previous years. So that's a positive feedback. Um, I do want to mention uh, Senator Rhodes, you haven't responded yet, so we're not sure if you're going to be in the parade. Everybody else has kind of responded. Um, I do want to mention on a down note that this is, might be the last parade. Um, we're trying to get the Kamehameha Lions to kind of take over the parade, but I'm probably going to need Brandon, your help, or a designee from the um, from the board to kind of help us because I, you know, it's like two guys trying to do. There's only like 25 tasks, but used to have like 10 guys, 10 guys and gals doing 25 tasks. Now it's two guys doing 25 tasks, which which is getting kind of onerous. So. Um, we're trying to elicit the support of the Kamehameha Alliance, which I'm a member of, and uh, we're you know, going to get more people. And already the you know, United Church of Christ, uh, Reverend Heather Bark, we already volunteered somebody to help us. So we, we're going to get this together. And I apologize for coming so late because we started in March. And I've, I've talked to Wessel. It's been a battle to get insurance. And we switched carriers, and 
we got it in two weeks. So, you know, uh, I apologize for coming so late, but we're, we're moving along and we'll keep you folks posted. So that's all I have. Thank you. I know I also want to say, you know, it's the, you know, because of construction of rail, some of our businesses that used to donate to us are have closed up. So we rely on a lot of individual donors. We like, I hate to say like Wes and Brandon help us out. So if you, anybody wants to support the parade, we'll be sending out letters later on. Um, quite frankly, it costs only, I should say only, it costs $3,000 to run a parade. The Lions pay two, pay 1000 So we look for about $2,000 from community support. So we'll be coming out. And that's primarily to pay for the bus for the Kwanano kids to come over, uh, parking, uh, the parking sign. And that's basically it, you know, so. We're a low cost, short parade, but um, the, because of COVID, we've had a lot of response of, hey, where's the parade? So we feel it kind of helps the community, uplifts the community, but it's mostly for me, mostly for the kids. You like to see the kids really happy. So please help us. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, any, any questions from the board? For, for those who are new to the board, we've been doing this participation since day one, since I've been here. And uh, the, Vernon has done a great job. And uh, I'll, I'll make a, a contribution or donation only if I get my own Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. That, that's one of the issues because we have to ha have council member Tyler. We have to ask him if he could walk because no, he'll, he'll walk. Carl used to ride. Yeah. And now, but then we want, um, I guess, uh, Representative Jenna to be able to ride. So we're going to ask them to swap because the Corvette Club only provides like six Corvettes. So we'll do, we'll do I know Wes, Wes always bugs me. He wants to ride, but you know. We'll do it on a seniority. seniority. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, then you can ride. It. But thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Dale? Dale, go ahead. I, are you a 501C? No, that's the problem. We're not. By switching to Kamehameha Alliance, they are a 501C. See, so you know, donations you next year. Yeah, that's the problem. Even like McDonald's and stuff, they don't donate to us anymore because they want a 51C3 designation, which we are not. So that's why we're switching to. So you're kind of donating out of giving out the goodness of your heart. Brandon, go thank ahead. you so much for coming. Uh, Wes, at the appropriate time, can we make a motion to support the parade? Yeah. Uh, Yep, I move that that the neighborhood board takes a vote to support the parade. Is there a second? Seconded by Dale or Don? Both of them. Both of them. All right. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor of the neighborhood board supporting the uh, Lilia Palama Christmas parade on the twenty fourth of November? Where I encourage everybody to to join us. Rip. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed? Okay, none. Motion to carry. Thank, Thank you, Vern. You. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving right along. I don't. Uh, there's the last on the agenda was the state fire emergency plan. I'm going to hold that off. It's already talked to our representative. See if they got anything for us. Um, going on to community organizations. Malhia, are you here? Nobody. How about St. Francis? St. Francis. No. Oh, okay. Just for your information, I was invited to, uh, by St. Francis to uh, uh, celebrate a, one of the residents' 100th birthday. So I represented the uh, Neighborhood Board 14 and uh, presented a lay in uh, actually a, a U.S. Army cap. He was a, a fellow veteran, so uh, it was very impressive. And he's the only, I think, the only 100-plus uh, resident at St. Francis. So uh, it was a very nice uh, ceremony. Uh, Lana Keela? So we had a mix up and I don't have a uh, handout for you folks, but uh, I think Spencer has a link to put in it and then everybody in the chat and everybody got an email for the newsletter. The main thing is that the fall 10 week classes start officially the week of September 18th. So if you're interested in taking one of their 85 classes, which range from ping pong to mahjong to uh, ukulele to 
computers, all types of computer stuff to, what was the one I saw and I thought, oh my gosh. Uh, composting wormies, learning how to compost. So all of those three classes are available and next week, this week, next week, you should go and sign up 60 plus, you are, you can be a member. Terrific, thank you. They do great work, great work. Keep it up. Uh, oh, and, and and a lot of field trips to all over the place. The aquarium, to the um, bot botanical gardens, to it's the one that I, yeah, lots of places I'd like to go. And I always ask the question, the average age is about? Uh, about three years ago, it was 85. I'm too, I'm too young. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Carol. Any questions? Okay, moving right along. Let's see, friends of the Lehigh Valley. Oh, heavens. Yeah, so I've spoke with Senator Chen Oakland, um, who's the head of the organization. And, you know, she's trying to get a date for that opening she says she starts to consult with the um head librarian there so as soon as we get a date we'll invite all of you down so but i did talk to her about it okay. we'll stay tuned any other nonprofit organizations okay uh announcements the next uh, regular meeting will be on october 9th monday same time same same venue and uh, any anybody else want anything to add yes hey, um council member is very aware that many members of the community are concerned about the closure of Foodland uh, this month on the 24th uh, down by uh, uh, McDonald's, right? It's the, it's the Fergus uh, and Company land, they own it. And so we're inviting uh, one of the heads of that company to come down to discuss the future of the Foodland Liliha site at our next October the 9th meeting. We understand that you know, it's Foodland's choice not to renew their lease down there, but we wanted to talk with the landowners to see what the future may hold and to have a meaningful discussion, not only from them, but also from the community for suggestions as to what that new site could be. So we just wanted to let you know that. If you can. Yeah. Thank you. Any other announcements? Not again. Congratulations to our new treasurer. If we find the money, and I want to thank everybody for coming this evening, and welcome back to my my. And for those who are joining us, out what's left. Thank you for joining us, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, unless there's no other business, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Moved by Brandon, seconded by Carol. Uh, any objections? If not, all those in favor of adjourning, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Uh, the meeting's adjourned as of 9 7.